Yeah, thank you for, for the invite. I'm very happy to be able to um, to join you, even if from um, so far away as uh, Sydney. Uh, so I hope you're enjoying uh, your morning. Um, uh, what I have for you today is um, a little bit of the free energy principle, which is um, some of you may be uh, aware of, others might be much more familiar of, and some I will take this there might be at least one in the room that has never uh, heard about um, the free energy principle so um, that's what I'm going to do with you today so I'm going to um, try to um, look at the free energy principle from two kinds of um, pathways uh, so to speak um, and in order to do that, I'm going to pick up a very general um, question in cognitive science, uh, an umbrella question in cognitive science, such as how do we understand living behavior? So we can take that as to be the kind of like general question uh, in cognitive science that the free energy principle uh, itself, along with other frameworks, um, aims to um, to explain or to understand or to speak to. Um, at least. So um, we start from uh, in cognitive science from looking at uh, the natural world and that's where science begins. Um, and once we do look at the natural world, um, there are a few, um, a few patterns that we may notice and one of them is how to define or describe life. And it can be said um, that life if can be uh, defined as continuous challenges of maintaining a delicate equilibrium between order and chaos. And here you start to see why I called this talk um, on the edge of chaos, because life sits really nicely on that soft uh, spot right between order and chaos. And because um, there is this uh, continuous change that one must maintain a certain delicate equilibrium, um, that means that uh, what living beings have to do is they really must um, adapt to the ever-shifting environment. And for that, uh, they must strategically act by responding to those changes such in the environment, such, as, such that they minimize the entropy and ensure their survival. So in very simple terms, when one must interact, must act upon the environment in order to remain alive. And this seems to be factual, um, not only for, for um, highly complex beings like, like us, like human beings, but also for all forms of life, that we must uh, face this continuous, ever-changing um, environment and, and adapt to it. So then, and the free energy principle comes up as well it's a it's a potential explanation uh or a potential way of understanding uh or formulate hypotheses in order to precisely understand or answer that kind of like general question of um uh that we started off with which is how to understand living behavior and of course then we can and we should uh, look into more integrated kind of um, kind of questions to look at, but the free energy principle comes as um, a potential solution to understand um, patterns of life, so to speak. Um, so I want to guide you through that so that you kind of like get so that so that you kind of get a, 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 at least an idea of what the free energy principle is. Um, those of you who have not come across it. And also, more importantly, that um, one is aware that there are two ways in which, uh, two pathways or two uh, ways in which we can understand the free energy principle. So I'm going to present it to you the two different ways, and you are going to be in the end adjudicating uh, which one, if any, uh, you find reasonable. So the free energy principle has a big claim. And the claim is that it offers a unifying theory uh, from cells to agent level experience, it claims to offer that kind of like unifying theory. And for many, this is a grand claim and one needs to be careful about it um, because um, of that kind of like large scope of um, explanatory power that it is claimed to have. 
Now, there are two key components uh, to the free energy principle. One is uh, predictive coding, and the other one is active inference. And I've got right here on the bottom um, two uh, foundational papers that you can look at um, if you are interested in looking at those uh, key components. In the interest of time, I will not be able to uh, go over it. But I do want to um, tell you about some of the applications of the free energy principle. And I'll just simply leave you with, well, it's a unifying theory um, that you can you can explain things um, in different scales. I want to show you that um, that has been done. It's work that is in the making. Um, it began as um, a theory for neurobiology with life as we know it. Uh, it was a 2013 paper uh, by Carl Friston, who is an uh, architect behind the, the, the free energy principle. And then it, uh, of course, has been evolving into neuroscience, for example, where we have applied uh, that principle to understand or to see if we could find the same pattern, the pattern dynamics, neural dynamics across uh, um, different levels or scales um, of the brain. And we uh, claim in this paper, uh, our understanding is that um, we can. And then there is a, a vast, um, a vast uh, literature on applications of the free energy principle in psychology. I only have here one example um, of uh, learning, um, uh, for example, or cognitive science. But there's, there's of course, a few that it's uh, worth looking at if you are into this literature. A more recent one that we are um, very excited about is the applications that we are developing of the free energy principle now to artificial intelligence. And it's interesting because it became, it, it began as a theory to understand uh, the brain and neural dynamics. And now uh, we are kind of like employing this neurobiology, this systems biology kind of approach to develop um, artificial systems as forms of, uh, as we call it, as, a, uh, as we call it, um, ecosystems of intelligence. So then uh, we also um, employ the free energy principle to explain um, ecosystems. So uh, the thought here, so that um, uh, you get the gist, is the thought is that um, anything that is a complex system can be uh, modeled and can be understood under uh, the free energy principle. So that's that's the thought. Okay. Now this is a, a very important um, kind of graph that comes in um, the Active Inference book 2022, and I got that graph from there. And it is important because in the in this graph you find two pathways to get to understand active inference. And active inference is a corollary uh, framework of the free energy principle. It is kind of similar to um, something that we might be more familiarized with, which is Bayesian inference, but it's slightly different. And that's why we get these two pathways to active inference. One is more similar to Bayesian inference, the other one is less similar. One is more philosophical, the other one is less philosophical. So I'm going to kind of like guide you through these two different ways. So um, you can see here on the top, this one will be the high road uh, to, the French, to the active inference. And then on the bottom, it's the low road uh, to active inference. And what happens is that um, on taking the low road to active inference, it's very similar to those in the room that are familiarized with Bayesian inference. It's very similar to Bayesian inference. Um, so you start off with the base theorem and you start off with predictive coding and then you go up the scale with generative models and perception as inference, predictive coding, planning as inference, patient brain, and then you get to the active inference. And I'm going to say a little bit more um, about um, that um, in the end. But for now, I'll just leave you with um, it's quite similar to the Bayesian brain or what we formulate as the Bayesian brain and we find that as um, state-of-the-art literature on um, modeling um, the brain. But I want to focus with you now on the high road. Why do I want to do that? Because I am assuming that this is the road that is less, uh, the road less traveled, uh, the one that is less known, um, and the predictive coding one is the one that uh, we usually have more are more familiarized with. 
but it's not the only way to uh, get to active inference. There's also the high road. I uh, that just tend to find the high road much more interesting from a systems biology perspective, and that's exactly what I want to um, tell you about today. So I'm going to um, just uh, gesture again to the question that kind of like just so that we don't lose sight of what we do in cognitive science, we want to understand cognitive behaviors and hopefully we will um, break down this question into much more interesting and integrated kind of like questions that um, to develop experimental uh, paradigms um, and investigate um, cognition with. But let's just use these as our North Star, so to speak. So then once we do, and here's where I'm going to just really quickly go through the low road. Once we look or we or we get to active inference through the low road, and again, it's very similar to uh, predictive coding, the, fund the, the fundamental question that sort of like lifts our studies off the ground is how does the brain infer a world, a world state of affairs in order such that we adapt to our environments? So the low road to active inference is very much related to predictive coding as a modeling uh, technique. Um, but it is also for those of you in the room that have a background in philosophy, it is very much uh, close to uh, what we call in philosophy of mind or analytic philosophy of mind, um, what we call the, 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 the mind machine uh, metaphor. Uh, the computational theory of mind. So that would be the low road so that you have some pointers and you can find where this is in the literature. Why? Well, because um, it, it can be roughly put in the following argument. If minds do not have access to the world, they must build predictive computational models of the world. Then minds or brains, however you define it, do not have access to the world. Therefore, minds are computational predictive models. And as you can see, this is exactly Helmholtz. Um, the mind is a predictive machine. That's Helmholtz. Uh, so that's where um, the low road to active inference is quite similar, quite close to um, predictive coding, um, as well as uh, Helmholtz um, understanding of the brain and mind. OK, why is this relevant? Well, it does. Um, it does sort of like speak to these arguments speak to or give direction to one way of setting up experiments setting up computational models in order to understand the brain um so and that uh, direction is or comes from the question that motivates it and the question is how, how does the brain infer a world state of affairs such that we actually see we observe in the natural world world that living systems are adapting um, to the world. Okay, so then um, there are a few uh, theories um, that fit the description of the low road to active inference um, in the literature of traditional analytic philosophy of mind or computational theory of mind, or they are known as uh, predictive processing theories. And um, those of you that are coming from a more philosophical background, of course, they're going to uh, find here uh, more familiar ground um, than those coming from a more neuroscience kind of background. But nevertheless, um, I'm going to uh, just give a very brief overview uh, because they do seem quite similar, but they're not, as, as always, uh, they're not. There are, there are, there are points of, of commonality. But let me uh, tell you where, where they differ. Okay, so then we have predictive coding, which is basically prediction error minimization understanding of the brain. And here, the understanding of cognition is um, cognition is it being reduced to the brain. Um, so in this uh, particular kind of way of thinking, um, you find uh, a major foundational book, such as The Predictive Mind, and uh, papers such as the self-evidencing brain. And these, uh, this is work by Yakui. And by the way, I know that I think he's going to give a talk after me um, or tomorrow or something like that. So that's Yakup Hui. Uh, and he's going to tell you much more about it. And he's going to expand precisely on here. And what it tells us uh, that really shows the difference between him and the other theories is, I find, at least in this particular paper, the self-evidencing brain, where it tells us the mind can then be understood in throwing away 
the body, the world, and other people. So um, in this understanding or in this theory of predictive processing or prediction aromanization, what Jacob um, is understanding here is that the brain is, or cognition itself can be understood as to what happens inside the skull. Now, then we have radical predictive processing, and it's slightly different because any Clark um, brings in the body to do some kind of role into cognition, right? So then we have cognition understood as this brain body kind of dynamics, right? And it tells us that, for example, in this, what I find is the most radical way in which Andy has put his theory is in this paper, radical predictive processing. And in here, he explains this understanding that it has of body uh, where action here serves perception by moving the body and sense organ around you know in ways that aim to serve up predicted patterns of st stimulation so that's the way in which andy understands the body and many within radical predictive processing understand the body the body uh, is part of uh, i dare say for those of you who are um, who are more familiarized with the theory, with motor control theory, right? So that's the understanding of action and the body. We can understand it and, modul and, and model, model it through motor control theory um, narratives. So then uh, we have um, active inference. And active inference is slightly different because it brings another kind of like variable into this coupling. And it formulates uh, cognition in terms of brain, body, environment. So you can see already that there are these different ways of, uh, uh, of these, these different, these, at least these three different theories. And the ways in which they differ is that, um, you know, in the ways in which they understand cognition and define cognition. Some are more generous and some are uh, more um, uh, rudimentary. So then one point where they uh, converge, they can converge, is to say that cognition is a computational process. Of what kind? Well, of encapsulated inference systems. Remember our argument, because cognition is encapsulated, because organisms do not have this direct access to the world, therefore, they must be in a permanent state of having to infer what's going on outside in the world. So it is possible to understand active inference too, uh, as well as predictive processing, as well as predictive coding, in terms of these computational processes. And this is the low road to active inference. And I'm just uh, going to, uh, no spoilers, but I'm already uh, going to tell you that the high road to active inference does not understand cognition necessarily as computational processes. So it's going to be slightly different. So then the low road from active inference, what do we get from this particular uh, path of uh, for understanding or utilizing this theory to understand uh, cognition? Well, we begin with the claim that brains are predictive computational machines. Remember, we, be, we begin with Helmholtz, we begin with, with, with Bayes' theorem. Uh, and then from beginning with that premise that brains are predictive computational machines, Helmholtz, then that kind of like premise is going to lead us to when we set up experiments, when we set up computational models, then it's going to lead us to, okay, how is it that brain infra the world state of affairs such that we actually can understand how living systems in the natural world adapt to their environments and maintain and remain uh, alive? So this kind of like then the idea is that this, the, the experiments that we set up or the computational models that we set up, they're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of this premise and uh, this question. But then the question that is important to ask from a philosophical point of view, if you don't mind doing a little bit of um, what, we call, what we call conceptual analysis, um, is then what is computation? So what does it mean when we say that the brain is a computer or the mind is a computer? What does it mean when we say that um, cognition is computational processes? So the question is, what do we understand by computation? Because we, of course, are very much aware, uh, after all, we've been developing uh, all of these computational uh, frameworks, models, power in order to um, understand the natural world, which is not reduced 
to the brain, which is not reduced to human systems, which is not reduced even to life. Uh, we develop computational models to understand and predict the weather uh, and all of those other complex systems uh, that are around us, right? So then the question is, we may be, um, we may have computational capacities, computational power, because we develop those um, as practices that we do in science and in techno science. But what does it mean to say that the mind is computation? Can we say that? So that's kind of like what I'm trying to, you know, dispute here and test here a little bit with you and thinking together. What is computation? Is computation something that there is out there in the world? Or is computation something that comes out of our techno scientific practices? So, um, computation is a manipulation of. Um, I, I will have a go and I will have an attempt on this, and I will, will say that, um, to my understanding, we can define, if you have to, we can define computation as a manipulation of numerical and logical structures. And these are practices engaging with them that allow us to make inferences and comprehend causal relationships with the world. In a way, um, we, we can ask whether we were born with these kinds of capacities or not, and that's the nature-nurture kind of debate that uh, we know very well. Um, I would tend to think that um, the kinds of computations that we've come to do, either individually or, or collectively uh, in science, there are many examples. There's the example of like back in the day when we used to use the, as a species, we used to use um, uh, the abacus in order to help us make calculations. Then later on, on um, we use the Turing machines, and uh, here it's it's partially um, uh, behind this other one, but it is a model of a black hole. So we become ever more sophisticated to develop models of uh, black holes, and then here you have a model of a large language model. So there is an evolution in the computational capacity, computational power, if you will. Um, that's is an outcome that emerges from or is part of our scientific but also our daily practices as we um, develop um, and during cognitive development and we start learning um, to count and to put concepts together and make logical structures and inferences and those kinds of things that um, then we do during that we learn to do um, during cognitive development. So I tend to think that um, these kinds of computational capacities are not independent of our daily practices and our cognitive development. So I tend to think that there is no such thing as computation in the wild. We cannot find a model of the black of a black hole in the wild. That's kind of like the idea put in put in very simple terms. So this 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 maps upon or touches upon something that is quite known in the literature as the map territory fallacy. Right. Uh, once the map um, becomes the territory, then the map ceases to be useful. Uh, so that's the well-known uh, map territory, territory fallacy to think that um, the computational that the computation that we use to understand a complex system is an ontological prescriber of that system itself. Because when the model becomes the system, it's not a model anymore; it's the system. Uh, so then, because of all of those thoughts and all of that philosophy of science literature, I tend to think that there is no computation in the wild. This is a practice. It's something that we uh, scientists do and develop um, ever more. And um, I would say that from the fact that we can um, use manipulation of numerical and logical structures in our scientific practice, or practices, but also in our daily practices to make sense of what we observe in the natural world, well, two typos. Um, from that fact that we can develop and use these numerical logical structures to help us understand and make sense and look at patterns in the natural world, it does not necessarily follow that cognitive behaviors, which is that thing that we really want to understand, are of the same structure as the models that we use. So that means they are not computational in character because computational is the model that we use. So here, what I'm really, really, really having in mind is to be extremely careful not to fall to fall on the map territory fallacy. Okay, so then I want to 
say that there's no competition in the wild and and and, and I, I this is not exhaustive and in the interest of time um i will say that there are at least three uh criteria for competition um to be something that is a product of human cognitive behavior for, com for competition to exist in a world like our world we need a full embodied agent like us. We need symbolic enculturation, like cognitive development, and we need that to happen in a situated cultural practice. Um, sometimes I use the example of Mogul, Mowgli uh, in the jungle, whether you would have this kind of like situated cultural practice in order to uh, be able to develop computational um, frameworks or uh, power that uh, in the ways that we do. So it needs to be situated. That's the idea. And I think that... I think that I've, I've, I've brought up a machinery with me because I think that Einstein was on to something like this in his geometry and experience when he says it is certain that mathematics generally, and particularly geometry, owes its existence to the socioculturally I added, socioculturally situated need, so our need, which was felt of learning something about the relations of real things to one another. So basically what he's saying here, to do a little bit of philosophy of science with you, is that he's saying that what is real is the real natural world that we observe. And then we create um, these theories, these models that are um, our own uh, scientific practices in order to understand relations and patterns between those real things that exist in the, in the natural world. And um, here we have um, another philosopher of science. Uh, uh, quite, uh, she's quite, quite talented and famous. Um, and she has this view um, in the same kind of like sense where she says many scientists are aware of this phenomenon, which is the map uh, territory fallacy, which uh, which is why many refer to their models as viable models as opposed to accurate or true models. So the idea is that there is not an isomorphic relations between the computational model that we use to understand the mind and the mind itself. So these are completely two different phenomena, right? One is an epistemic tool to understand the other. So that's the thought. So then um, I'm going to skip this, this one. Um, uh, and I'm going to just bring you a uh, logical uh, modus ponens uh, in order to just bring the point home uh, through logics. Um, so the idea here is that if models are then, like I'm saying, and many are saying, um, uh, very enthusiastic about um, the map uh, territory fallacy, if models are tools to understand and predict living behavior, then living behavior is not of the same kind as the modeling tools. Models or computational models are tools to understand living behavior. Therefore, living behavior is not of the same kind as the modeling tools which means that living behavior is not computational in character. Those are things that we develop and um, engage with in order to get more explanatory power over cognition. This brings us to the high road to active inference, which I find more compelling. And here, uh, the question is not about how do uh, living systems or the brain, depending on how uh, you want to define cognition, um it's not about how do they see how do they infer uh, the world but the question for the high roads of to act inference is more about how do living beings persist and adapt in an ever-changing environment and i will come back to this in the very end but these are completely different questions for cognitive science and i think that here do not take my word for it just think about which one or if any, uh, motivates you at all, which one do you find more uh, compelling to persist as a cognitive scientist? So then how do living beings persist and adapt in an ever-changing environment would be the question motivating taking the high road. And the high road, uh, the argument would go more like this. Um, if living beings are open systems, active inference is a suited, suited epistemic framework. Well, living beings do not want to dissipate. They do not want to increase entropy or chaos, if you are, or if you wish, for those who um, are working on those uh, frameworks. And when we say living beings do not want to dissipate, it's exactly the same thing as saying in premise one, that living beings are open systems. They do not want to dissipate. That's, by definition, an open system. And then active inference is a suited epistemic framework for understanding 
an organism's behavior because for understanding what, why they are acting in the ways that they are, such that they will push back on that second law of thermodynamics. But I'll get back to this. So then once you really frame your thinking like that, the question that you're after is a very different question. It's not about how does the brain infer a state of affairs in order for uh, to adapt to the environment, but it's rather how do living beings persist and adapt in an ever-changing environment. And what I find compelling in, these, um, in this question is that it really brings us to first look at the natural world and look at the patterns that we observe and understand that life is about that life is about persisting and adapting to an ever-changing environment and it's quite it's quite i feel much more confident to pursue something that is quite quite an observation of the natural world rather than something that would be a premise of um of a theoretical premise about minds are computational in character for example which is the low road but i will come back to this just to give you some pointers already Okay, so then the burden of proof of, of this uh, little, little argument that I brought to you is uh, precisely in, in premise to living beings do not want to dissipate, they do not want to increase in entropy or chaos. So then what we have to do is explain, well, how is that the case? And when we set up experiments or models is precisely to show that this is the case or to test whether this is the case. Is this the case? Yes. Is it not the case? Why? So then they would allow us to, in our set of experiments that we do, uh, it would allow us to um, prove uh, or not um, the free energy principle. That would be the end point is, OK, do these organisms behave in ways that they accord to the free energy principle or not? So that would be the sort of like the framework that we are uh, navigating. Okay, so um, I will just start by uh, saying that to understand the high road to the free energy principle, I, I find it extremely useful to begin with the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law states that, um, in very brief, that an open system will tend to dissipation, which means the increase of surprise, entropy or chaos, depending on which framework or, or field you're coming from, physics, biology, um, complex systems, so in, in brief, an open system will tend to dissipation. And as we know, an open system is potentially everything that we know, right? So it's everything that is, a, every system that is exchanging energy, matter, and information with the environment. So then when we are asking this question about how do living beings resist the second law, because after all, if you think about it, the, the, the living systems are open systems. But they're not tending to dissipation. They somehow seemingly resist the second law of thermodynamics. And they push back. And the ways in which they push back, that second law, is precisely by the ways in which they act upon the world. So when we ask this question about how do living systems resist the second law, we are doing cognitive science. right? So we are asking questions about living beings that, one fact, do not typically, and typically is in bold for a reason, there are, of course, uh, exceptions, and those exceptions are extraordinarily interesting. Uh, living beings, typically, they do not want to die. That's an observation, right? So that's an observation from the natural world. And that's, that's, that's really what I find at least most compelling is to begin with the observation of patterns in the natural world. So then um, what, it, what this means is it doesn't really matter the point in time or space that I'm going to find a living system interacting with the environment, I will very likely find in whatever it is, the activity that that living system is engaged with, uh, that activity is going to have something to do with pushing back on the second law, right? So it's going to be an activity that is most convenient to survival and adaptation. And this might, might seem like not much, but I think that we get something. So um, let's see. When we look at living systems as resisting this second law of thermodynamics, we get at least three um, important conditions uh, that follow. One is that they are thermodynamically open. The other is that they are operationally closed and two together bring the system into a state of uh, permanent state of precariousness. And this is going to be useful, I think. So a system that is thermodynamically open is a system that is not closed <laughs> by definition. So it's coupled with their environments and it is directly exchanging energy and matter. And in this 
change is what allows them to interact with the, with the world and, in fact, just remain alive. And then, on the other hand, there are systems that are operationally closed, closed because they are self-organizing systems. They maintain homeostasis. So in that sense, they have and maintain their sense of identity and autonomy. Uh, and they resist some kinds, some pressures of the environment, not all, because some uh, would really launch them into um, the most, the highest state of precariousness, which would be death. So it is a state of precariousness that we really find that being on the edge of chaos, right? It is because the living systems are in this state of precariousness, or pushing back on the stressors from the environment, trying to remain alive, acting upon the world to remain alive, that uh, they are and live and exist on the edge of chaos. So then understanding precariousness is understanding and making sense in whatever experiments or competition models that we do, the patterns of this continuous exchange of living systems with the environment pushing back on the second law. And that is what I find that can be extremely interesting to model by active inference as well as complexity science. And this comes in different forms, like in, in niche construction, um, uh, 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 living beings, or in the forms in which we engage uh, in, we as more sophisticated kind of like um, uh, activities that we do, such as scientific activities, etc. Now the question will become, okay, so how? How do systems, how can we explain it under the free energy principle? Well, uh, the free energy, the first print, the free energy principle is a first principles approach. What does that mean? Well, it's got a principle. The principle is that organisms must maintain their existence, and of course, there are um, uh, there are some exceptions. And how do they do that? How do they maintain their existence? Because this is the principle, right? Well, uh, they will tend towards preferred states, and these preferred states are defined by niche specific evolutionary adaptations as well as uh, learned cognitive goals during their lifespan. And they avoid these preferred states of the environment, which would be surprising states uh, for uh, the system, which uh, the highest uh, surprising state, which we have face transition like death. So an organism's action is such that it follows a unique imperative, minimizing the surprise of their sensory observation, such that they avoid completely that phase transition that is death. So then the question for us is, what's news, really? Well, we do have something that we didn't have before, right? We have uh, now an understanding of an organism's action is such that it follows a unique imperative, the minimizing the surprise of the sensory observations. And if this is the case across scales, and by across scales, I mean from, from cells to all the way up to agents like us, then that's quite something. Active inference then offers that mathematical solution or framework to understand uh, behavior and uh, potentially predict behavior. And I'm going to uh, skip this in the interest of time. Um, this would be uh, the regular kind of uh, framework um, uh, from active inference. And I want to say something about that before I go which is that um, this is a framework that is scale free and that is what makes it, I think, cool, is that we can apply that from bacteria to brains um, to uh, plants or, um, or anything really that is an open system. Um, and I'm gonna skip this because in the interest of time. Now, what I want to really um, uh, wrap up with is the discussion of whether active inference is suited to explain cognitive behaviors or not. And this is just thinking we do here, a comparative analysis between the low road and the high road. So on the low road, we begin with the premise that cognition is computational, right? And on the high road, we begin with the premise that living beings do not want to dissipate. And as an exercise, um, as a philosophical exercise, um, if these were to be, uh, if we wouldn't know anything else and these were to be uh, a matter of reason, of reasoning about uh, which uh, pathway would be most reasonable, um, then the question for us when we do a little bit of philosophy um, of science is, okay, which, which premise would sound more reasonable to defend or easier to defend, right? 
because that means in, in logics, that would mean that one necessitates much more hidden assumptions and one does necessitate more hidden assumptions than the other one. So when we say that living beings do not want to dissipate, that's something that we can observe in the environment. When we say that cognition is computational, that requires more hidden assumptions that one really needs to uh, bring up the machinery to, to, to really prove that and show that. Okay, but let's just go with the, with, with the comparative analysis between the two. Uh, the law road um, is fundamentally uh, rooted into the premise that cognition is computational of the kind of cognitive psychology, uh, computational information processes um, occurring in the form of um, predictive coding. So then that really sets the stage for us to, in our daily practices um, of, of our cognitive science of practices uh, to develop experiments, if we are working on experimental designs or to develop computational models, if we are doing computational models, or to develop um, brain or mind theories, if we are doing philosophy about how does the brain infer that world state of affairs, and then, and, and then in all different kinds of like cognitive activities, is um, all the way from perception, social cognition, learning, then we are going to use this framework and we're going to try to see if we can get um, some development of the theory uh, forward. And of course, the ultimate goal being uh, the explanatory power, the explanatory virtue that we get out of it. Now, um, it seems that the low road might have some uh, more limited explanatory power in comparison to the high road, which is might be something for us to keep in mind. Um, and uh, a, an argument that has been formulated against um, precisely uh, these kinds of theories in general is that if one uses this framework, um, this predictive coding framework or this active inference framework to apply and explain biological systems, as well as I told you in the very beginning, ecosystems, then are we saying that both life or living systems and non-living systems are computational i don't know if, if you see what i mean but if we are saying that by virtue of using this kind of like computational um model that the computational model is going to be isomorphic to the target that we are uh, trying to understand from biology to ecosystems then are we saying that um all systems that can be modeled by this kind of like framework are computational character so is their computation in the wild is that what we are saying that seems to be a contradiction but i'll leave that aside and now let's see what we get on the high road we begin with the premise that living beings do not want to dissipate and the question uh, is or uh, a question of how do living beings persist and adapt in an ever-changing environment and that sounds like a very umbrella kind of like question in cognitive science um, with, with, with a question with, uh, that we could start as a point of view. And then, of course, we hope to break down into uh, more precise questions for investigation. So then once we do begin with the how do living beings persist and adapt to ever-changing environments, which is general enough, then we can ask questions such as what models best explain it. And for that, we need Two things we need good reasoning we need good theories more than ever um there's uh, there's i think it was uh von neumann back in the 50s that had a beautiful quote that said nowadays everybody nowadays was in the 50s nowadays everybody's doing models if everybody's doing models there's nobody left to do the thinking that's the kind of thought here is like what models best explain uh, or answer the question. So on the one hand, we need good reasoning, we need good theories. And on the other hand, we need to set up good empirical questions, good empirical settings in order to test um, the validity of uh, these reasonings, these theories, as well as, of course, computational models when empirical uh, design is not possible. Okay, so what seems to be the case is that um, with a high road, it seems that we get more maximization of the explanatory power without falling into the trap of uh, that we have in the low road which is known in the literature as pan computationalism that everything is computation there is computation in the world we do maximize explanatory power such that we can say that we have a unifying theory 
this framework is possible that we can apply this framework for, for, for from cells to AI to ecosystems. So we, since we're not committing realistically or what we call uh, scientific realism uh, in philosophy of science, because we're not making the scientific realism move, then we can say that we are using this framework for its epistemic power so that we um, gain something we didn't have before, which is the understanding of a certain kind of system that we want to understand, can be cells, can be AI, can be ecosystems. Uh, so we have, we generate this understanding that we didn't have before, and uh, ideally we also get some uh, predictive power out of it. And that's good news, right? And then, and that seems to me reasonably that that's the high road is the one that really gets us to say, well, the free energy principle may be a unifying theory explanation. Sure, the the the, the low road may be less so. So then I want to get back to wrapping up this to the concepts that I presented to you as being foundational, important uh, three concepts and why, why so basically answering the question of uh, how the living beings uh, persist and adapt in an ever-changing environment, what models best explain it. I selected the free energy principle to bring before you. So now I'm going to tell you something about why I think that this framework is interesting to do that, okay? It's because of the ways in which I set up the two main um, conditions of an open system, like a living system, that launches the system into a third condition, right? So the two conditions that I set up was, I said that an open system or a living system is um, operationally closed and it is thermodynamically open, right? And I said that it is operationally closed um, because it maintains itself. It maintains a certain kind of identity. And I said that it is thermodynamically open because it is in this permanent um, exchange of matter, energy, or information with the environment. That's a good thing because that's exactly what keeps the system alive. And these two together is what makes the system be in this continuous state of precariousness, right? So it is continuously interact with the environment because it is precarious. Now, why is active inference interesting? Well, active inference is interesting because you can pick up this formalism, which has two sets of states, got the external states and it's got the internal states. And the cool thing about these two states is that they are what we call, they are conditionally independent from each other. That means that internal and external states do not directly influence one another. Right. And that is nice because that allows us to think and understand and model the ways in which a system is operationally closed. Right. Because internal and external states do not directly influence one another. So the system self organizes and is operationally closed. But then there is another set of states, which is the active and the sensory states. And it is through the direct exchange between active and sensory states that um, internal and external states are going to mutually influence one another. So, in a way, we can think that it is through this exchange between active and sensory states that this, we can understand this being thermodynamically open and explaining it mathematically, right? So then that means that the system and its environment reciprocally are directly influenced uh, and directly influence one another via this set of states that is the active and the sensory states. And that's kind of cool because that allows us to then model something that we could not model before, which is model precariousness, which is the ways in which what I was saying before, remember what I said before, it doesn't really matter what point of time or space that I'm going to uh, see or find a living being. I know at least one thing, the system is not wanting to die. So now what I will, what I need to understand is I need to understand that action in context. I need to contextualize and I need to then observe patterns. And once I have enough patterns, I can develop these kinds of models to understand idiosyncratic behavior. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, systems are in this state of precariousness, which, is, which means that living systems operate as being both closed and open. And uh, they do so, um, and because they are that, they are um, exploring uh, the environment for their own survival and adaptation. That's what it means to be in a state of precariousness. And that 
right there is what we observe in the natural world in 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 in, in living systems in human and non-human uh, living systems we observe them interacting with the environment acting upon the environment building the environment changing the environment in order to survive and survive and that and our position as cognitive scientists is to form patterns from these observations that we do. This is the real world, right? So this is the cool stuff. And what we want is we want from that observation that apparently would have no order, we want to create some kind of like intelligible explanation of those uh, observations that we do. So we can do that through cognitive patterns. And those are the ones that can emerge through precisely this vital living system environment coupling which is not an encapsulated form of computation. We can model by using computations, but it doesn't mean that this living system environment coupling reduces to it being a computer, right? So that's the thought there. That's the rejection right there um, on, the, on the low road to active inference. Now, why the free energy principle? Why is one and not a different one? Well, and the different one can be, of course, um, reasonable. Um, uh, one reason to think about the FEP, the free energy principle, as a framework understood under the high road to model uh, is that it can model a system that is both thermodynamically open and operationally closed. And this kind of framework you cannot really find uh, in many uh, frameworks that you can um, understand this very this very um, uh, precise two conditions of life that almost seem contradictory but together they really make sense to understand um, to understand life and how life persists by pushing back that second law so then well, the free energy principle, it does hold, I think, some scientific promise, but it is really up to us to develop some rigorous reasoning with philosophy and some uh, uh, empirical validation to precisely test whether or not these theories, this framework, these, these models uh, make sense and are reasonable. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much for your, your attention. I really appreciate it.